Hey, welcome Faithful Politics listeners and viewers. If you are watching us on our YouTube channel, I am your political host, Will Wright, and your faithful host, Josh Bertram, can't be here this week as he is out rediscovering a new relationship with corn. Um, but this week, we have with us Catherine Stewart. Um, she is an investigative reporter and author who has covered religious liberty, politics, policy, and education for over a decade. She has a book out, uh, The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. It's a rare look inside the machinery of the movement that brought Donald Trump to power. So thank you so much for uh, being on our show today, Catherine. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, um, um, we, you know, sought to have you on the show because a lot of our listeners had said, if you want to talk to anybody about, you know, like what's going on in sort of the religious circles, um, specifically as it applies to like dominionism or, you know, seven mountain mandate that you are the person to talk to. <laughs> so so uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that you can, you can drop some knowledge on us today and, and help us kind of work through some of these really crazy issues. Yeah. Well, there so, are a lot of crazy issues out there. So um, a lot of yeah. concerning issues out there, a lot of um, uh, complicated issues. I mean, faith politics, uh, it's everything your mother told you not to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, have the option of not talking about it these days. So. I Thanks. know. And here, and here we are, like, to, we decided to start a podcast that touches on both, both of the issues. <laughs> um, and at the time that we started the podcast, we would have never have expected that it would have become such, such a major issue, like in our, in our country. Um, so, so maybe, you know, maybe we can start off first by talking sort of broad, broad terms, like Christian nationalism. Um, and then maybe we can get, get down into some of the weeds. So, so for, <laughs> For starters, anybody that, that listens to our show knows that we've we've approached the subject of Christian nationalism over and over again because it just seems like it's something that's that's rising within kind of you know the Christian community and it's starting to sort of affect believers and non-believers. Um, so so I'd love to kind of get your your state of the union of where are we at with Christian nationalism in this country. Sure. Let's talk first about what Christian nationalism is and what it's not. Christian nationalism is not Christianity. It's not a religion. It's a political phenomenon that involves the exploitation of religion for political purposes. I think of it as combining two different things. So on the one hand, it's a set of ideas and ideology. And on the other hand, it's a political movement. It's an organized quest for power. As an ideology, it boils down to the idea that America was founded as a Christian nation, but Christian here, of course, referring to a conservative, a deeply conservative conception of the religion. And it's the idea that all of our problems stem from the fact that we have forsaken the supposed heritage of our country um, and, and of its founding. Uh, but this ideology is really just a tool. It's the most useful tool, I think, for a leadership-driven political machine that turns this story of America's allegedly conservative Christian founding into political power. And when I wrote The Power Worshippers, uh, my last book, you know, if you, if you think of it as a watch with different moving parts, you know, that work together, I wanted to sort of take the back off the watch and show what that machinery consists of. It consists of right-wing policy groups, legal advocacy organizations, pastoral organizations. A lot of the movement actually works through pastor networks um, that draw conservative-leaning pastors into these sort of um, groups that are then sort of politicized. There's a legal advocacy sphere. There are legislative uh, initiatives, very sophisticated use of data, and then a kind of uh, messaging sphere. Um, and what happens with this uh, machinery is that much of it functions as a giant voter turnout machine, a way of persuading a large subsection of the American public to vote for the political candidates that the movement favors and that are gonna do what the, the leadership of the movement wants. It's very much a leadership driven movement. And that, that's really interesting. So so is is Christian nationalism kind of like a umbrella term that um, also describes some of the subsets um, of, of the things that we see, you know, active in, in our politics and our day-to-day -day stuff? 
You know, there are different people use different terms to describe the movement because it and it's challenging because we are facing a kind of radicalism in a way in our politics and a sort of that includes like the the um, weaponization of misinformation, the licensing of corruption from top political leaders that frankly, I don't think we've ever seen before. Um, so I use the term religious nationalism in the subtitle of my book because sometimes it's easier to recognize. Well, first of all, I write about other countries, not just about America, although the book is mainly America focused, but I think it's easier sometimes to recognize when it's happening in other countries. So when you have leaders like Vladimir Putin in Russia, or Viktor Orban in Hungary or Erdogan in Turkey or leaders in Iran, when these leaders, these political leaders bind themselves very tightly to call ultra conservative religious figures in their own countries to consolidate, uh, consolidate authoritarian forms of political power. We recognize this as religious nationalism. And these leaders are using religious nationalism to bubble wrap themselves in sanctimony. It makes it harder to criticize them or to um, have any kind of democratic check on their power or corruption, any critique of their corruption, because they've got these holy men around them and they're like, you can't, you know, it gives them an aura of holiness. Uh, we think about someone like our former president who gives rallies and always has pastors and ultra conservative pastors as warm up acts. And that's a kind of religious nationalism. It's not that the lead, that former you know, that our former president himself may be sincerely religious. Again, it's not religion. It's a sort of exploitation of, of religion in this particular way. Got it. You know, um, so there's this person I follow on Twitter um, named uh, Jennifer Cohn, and she's a, this like election security advocate, political writer attorney. Um, she wrote about um, this, I don't know if it's a religious philosophy or whatever, but it's called, it's called the Seven Mountain Mandate. Um, for um, for the the Bucks County Beacon, in it she sort of discussed you know a lot of the very connections to this to this thought you know that includes Michael Flynn and Roger Stone and what have you and um, you know Roger Roger Stone who I've got very strong opinions about you know went went after her <laughs> like and and um, you know I really felt bad for for Jennifer because like she felt like she was being threatened. Um, and Roger Stone seems to be a very powerful person. Um, so I, I'm curious if maybe like you can unpack, like what is the seven mountain mandate? Um, it's something that I, I had no clue about um, probably six months ago. Um, and now I'm, I'm hearing more and more about it. So, so, so what, what is the seven mountain mandate? Seven mountains dominionism is the idea that a certain type of Christian is supposed to invade what they call the seven spheres or mountains or molders of culture, which includes things like business, government, um, education, um, religion, and, and there are sort of seven areas that have been identified in order to, as um, one of the founders of the Seven Mountain, one of the sort of big spreaders, the Seven Mountain Mandate, called it Take Back Dominion from Satan. The idea started uh, when God allegedly told uh, I believe it was Bill Bright of Youth with um, of uh, Campus Crusade for Christ Now crew and Lauren Cunningham of Youth with a Mission. Uh, he allegedly told them to invade these seven spheres and you know take control, uh, uh, dominion you know seize dominion in, in that way. And um, C. Peter Wagner, he was one of the folks who's considered a godfather of the movement. He. Uh, didn't invent it, but he sort of spread it very widely. Uh, Lance Wallnow is another figure who is very heavily involved in the spreading of this ideology. Um, and uh, they are part, um, well, Lance Wallnow for sure is part of a, a kind of movement or he collaborates with this movement called the New Apostolic Reformation, which emerged out of Pentecostalism and charismatic Christianity. As we know, Pentecostalism is more of a movement than an, a, um, a denomination. It's incredibly complex. There are very progressive Pentecostals and very conservative Pentecostals. But the New, New Apostolic Reformation is one of these kind of uh, movements that emerged out of it, as well as charismatic Christianity that has several different branches. It's incredibly complicated. So that's why it's kind of hard to talk about. But it's also extremely politicized. If you think about P. 
people like Dutch Sheets and Cindy Jacobs, who are these new apostolic reformation leaders, they've held very um, uh, political, explicitly political events and rallies and conferences. And uh, the interesting thing about Seven Mountains Dominionism is that for a long time, this type of movement was nowhere near the center of Republican power. And it was nowhere near the center of what I would call the mainstream of the Christian right. I, I'm thinking about, you know, over the past 14 years that I've been researching and writing about this movement, I've attended innumerable conferences and strategy gatherings and uh, summits. So at the, for a long time, you wouldn't find any representatives of the new apostolic reformation or this type of, you know, seven mountains dominionism at any of these events. And then I believe it was like 2015, I saw that Lance Wallnow had been invited to do a presentation at the Values Voter Summit. It's the annual event held by um, uh, the Family Research Council in conjunction with other organizations. And now it's been rebranded as Pray Vote Stand. But he was there and I was like, huh, that's pretty interesting. That's something worth noting. And now it seems like the language of dominionism has been mainstream within the you know, larger Christian right or Christian nationalist movement. So at Ralph Reed's annual Road to Majority Conference, which I try to attend every year, last year, 2021, there was a Seven Mountains breakout session. And I thought that was really remarkable. I mean, you have major political leaders uh, speaking, uh, I would say Republican political leaders speaking at that event. You had Mike Pence, you had uh, speaking, you had um, uh, Ron DeSantis speaking. And then there's a Seven Mountains Dominion breakout session. And at this year's event, a Road to Majority event, which I attended in Tennessee, there were two. There was a breakout session and also a Seven Mountains panel. And what we're seeing is that language of dominionism, which is very much about spiritual warfare. But listen, in political gatherings of all kinds, metaphors of war are very common. You know, we're in a war, we're gonna fight the other side, we're gonna win. But this year, at this year's gathering, the language seemed much more, I would say, tightly focused and frankly um, specific than it ever has. Uh, Donald Trump, former President Donald Trump, spoke at this year's Road to Majority Conference. And he said, I'm paraphrasing here, said, the greatest danger to our country is not our international foes as, 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 as bad as they may be. The greatest threat to our country is the enemy from within. And I think you know who I'm talking about. So this is deeply concerning. You know, Democrats were referred to as demonic, as satanic, as under the control of Satan. And this is really dangerous development. This is dangerous kinds of language. I was it's in other contexts in other countries, demonizing one's political opponents or targeting uh, a group, uh, 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 you know, for for uh, contempt like this, using a scapegoat has been, has become the language of genocide. And I do think that, um, you know, we need to come back to a point where we are all fellow Americans. We are all trying to solve our real problems that face our country collectively, and that we can view one another as people who may have different political viewpoints, but not completely delegitimizing de de um, our political opponents as demonic and satanic. That's just, it's, it's not true and it's not helpful. Yeah. So, so like when I, when I think, when I think about seven mountain mandate or dominionism, um, you know, a, a lot of what I've read anyways, seems, I don't know. It's, it's hard for me to describe, or it's hard for me to really take a, an opinion of it one way or another, because I think to myself, well, like I'm a believer, like I consider myself a Christian and I like to think that I take sort of elements of my faith that I believe make me a better person into my work environment, into what, into all the things I do socially, treat people with respect, you know, and, and I may not necessarily be like, you know, waving a Christian banner while I'm saying all this, but like, people I think would just associate, oh, yeah, Will's a Christian. So of course, he's going to be nice, you know, like, like, so how is that different than wanting to bring your faith into sort of, you know, media, culture, religion, politics, government, whatever? 
I mean, I think if you look at the way that language is being used in this very specific ways to target um, the uh, other political opinions as, as actually demonic or satanic, that's, that's not being a better person, that's dehumanizing fellow Americans. I mean, I think about the words of somebody like Senator Rick Scott of Florida, he said, um, you know, the backlash is coming, just mount up and ride to the sound of guns. They're all over this country. It's time to take our country back. It's, it's really, um, uh, you know, other speakers said that America is on the precipice, convening toward a, you know, convening, I would say, toward a socialist revolution, anarchy and chaos, and uh, you know, people with different political opinions, which frankly represent the majority of our country or, or, or a near majority of our country. Um, if you look at the last election, certainly a majority of our country um, as, as somehow illegitimate. I mean, a lot of people use the term Christian right to describe this movement, and I think that's fine, but the challenge with the term Christian right is that um, it almost puts this movement on the same footing as other sort of Christian democratic parties within, say, European countries that will engage in coalition work that don't demonize the other uh, side, but that will recognize them as legitimate political parties and that will engage with them in order to achieve their goals. This is a movement that doesn't believe in the integrity of elections. It appears to um, uh, discount the consequences of any election whose consequences they don't like. It engages in spreading lies about the, um, the lie of the stolen election, even when evidence uh, runs to the counter. And I have many specific examples of this in my writing and in my book. Um, it's a movement that um, licenses corruption, you know, to think about the corruption that, you know, has been engaged in, you know, our, their, their, their leader, who they sort of now revere and compare to King Cyrus is uh, under espionage investigation by the FBI, and yet movement leaders are actually standing by him and saying the FBI director is the one who should be investigated and, are, and arrested. This is just not normal. And I think, you know, this is also a movement that engages in conspiracism. I think about these Reawaken America tours. Well, you mentioned Mike Flynn earlier. He speaks at a number of them and uh, along with Roger Stone. And um, I, I attended one in, in California in San Marcos. And, you know, you had every conspiracy there. You had the great replacement conspiracy folks. And you had the, I spoke for half an hour to a, a very nice lady wearing like a wig wad t-shirt, you know, like a <laughs> QAnon lady. Here's a funny thing. A lot of the rank and file, they're really nice people. They seem to care about their families. They seem to, um, they appear to care about their neighbors, right? And their communities. And I think a lot of them really do want what's best for a country, but they've, Propaganda works. They've been fed all this propaganda by movement leaders, and that makes them much easier to control. So you think about some of the folks who engaged in that disgraceful assault on our capital, the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. Many of them had been persuaded that Donald Trump was God's choice. And so if he lost, it must be against God's will. They've also been told they're engaged in an apocalyptic struggle between absolute good and absolute evil. The consequences are too dire to ignore. So they could see themselves as patriots, even as they are assaulting the foundations of our democracy, our capital, and our electoral system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, you know, there's this really um great work of art um, that um, was done by these two gentlemen, Michael Altman and Jerome Kapolsky. We, we had them on the show um, and they, it's called like uncivil religion. And it, it's, it was really fascinating. Like they just, you know, grabbed all this stuff and it's like a chronicle of all the um, Christian references that are seen all throughout the January 6th attack. And, um, and I, and I'm curious based on what, you know, um, you know, like, do, do you think, that you know a christian inspired revolt or battle or war you know is is coming like is there is there is there something at hand that we as americans should at least be more uh, aware of because like I, I i i often tell um so our, our our faithful host pastor josh like i often tell him i said you know this is something 
like bad and i feel like it's something that needs to be handled in house like like by other believers because um like we don't want the military coming down in our christian churches you know <laughs> so of course not and and here's the other thing i think some of the most you know um impactful people who are standing up against this movement are themselves uh christian and i'm thinking about initiatives like vote common good christians against christian nationalism the baptist joint committee mm -hmm. the evangelicals i'm thinking about vote, um uh, faithful america i mean there's so many different organizations that are gathering to say this is really antithetical to the gospel this is not uh, not in our name and i don't think of it as a christian movement it's a political movement that's weaponizing religion for political purposes we've seen this happen over time we've seen even somebody like if you think about you know mussolini who wanted to consolidate authoritarian forms of political power well he was an atheist who happily fathered children out of wedlock and yet he partnered with the ultra conservative um elements within the catholic church in order to consolidate his sort of fascism right if you think about the way uh, religion has been weaponized and i mean openly theocratic countries you know mm -hmm. i think there are examples all over the world we can look to and uh are the leaders really like sometimes i'm asked are they true believers or are they just cynics well i think you know we can't know it's in people's hearts but i think you have i think it's all over the map to be honest yeah well what's what's the relation between like the seven mountain mandate and like bethel church uh because you know so bethel for 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 our non-believing um listeners i mean they're just this mega church and you know most churches sing their songs and sing the songs of Hillsong or used to, I don't, I don't know. I'm not really sure anymore, but like, like, like Bill Johnson, who's sort of like the, the, you know, the head of the Bethel community, um, I think wrote a book. I can't remember who it was with, but it, it was, it was touching on the seven mountain um, sort of idea. So, so what, what's, what's Bethel's sort of relationship to, to that idea? There are different Bethel churches. I mean, a couple, three nights ago, I spoke to um, Bethel Lutheran Church in uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, which was deeply concerned about this movement and its relationship to um, the gospel. And they're saying this is not the gospel as we understand. This is a kind of heresy. But yes, the uh, Bethel um, Church say that Sean Foyt is involved with um, is um, a very uh, different uh, story. You know. Religion in America is incredibly, Christianity alone is incredibly complicated. But if you look at somebody like uh, Sean Foyt, who's the, do you know who he is? He's mm -hmm. the pastor who started during the pandemic, this Let Us Pray movement, where he's having these very public events. Um, you know, I can't speak specifically to the leader of his church and, uh, you know, the fact that he's referencing Seven Mountains, Man Mountain Man the Seven Mountains Mandate shows how the movement is being, you know, whether they are explicitly seven mountains or whether they're just adopting that language. I can't know for sure without, you know, doing a little research and having my notes in front of me, but what it shows regardless is that this is a movement that is, the seven mountains movement is incredibly radical. I mean, it's incredibly anti-democratic and it, um, it, it's being mainstream within the movement. You know, Charlie Kirk of Turning Point USA, and Turning Point USA Action, he gave a speech in which he said, finally, we have a pre president who understands, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, finally, we have a president who understands the seven mountains. Now, I mean, does anybody really think that, you know, Donald Trump, I mean, you, you think about him, he's hardly an example of what the movement would call you know, so-called family values. But see, here's the irony to me. This is a movement that claims to stand for family values. But this shows this shows how it's really not a, a, a about religion. They're they're allied. They're they're first of all, the movement takes a lot of support from ultra wealthy a cadre of ultra wealthy individuals. I'm just off the top of my head. I'm thinking about the Prince DeVos family juggernaut. I mean. You know, Google one day Betsy DeVos's houses and boats. <laughs> okay, I will. The boats, like forget the house, forget it, just the <laughs> boat. Um, and then, and then, you know, people like the Lindsays or people like 
um, the Wilkes brothers, these fracking billionaires in Texas, or think about the Green family that owns Hobby Lobby. So there, the movement is gets a lot of money from these folks. I mean, you know, huge, huge amounts of money. This is a very well-funded movement. And a lot of these folks are as committed, if not more committed, to far-right economic positions as they are in the so-called culture war position. So it's about low taxes or no taxes for the rich. It's about concentration of wealth. It's about, um, you know, on the very upper 0.1%. It's about um, minimal rights for the workforce um, and, uh, you know, hollowing out healthcare, hollowing out social services. And it's, it's a kind of ideology that actually this you know, we have record economic inequality in our, in our country right now. Um, and it's, it's making life so much harder for so many American families to succeed. So this is a movement that claims to stand for family values, and yet they are allied with politicians who are endorsing these policies that are making it harder for families to succeed. And that's a bit of a, a digression, but I, I do think it's really important to note that there is a kind of you know, it shows that this is really not about the so-called culture wars, and this is not about religion. It's about economic policy. It's about broad-based social policy. It's about foreign policy. Yeah, you know, and, and I'm wondering, like, how how does, like, like how does the recruitment or the I don't know evangelism of this movement even like survive? Because, like, because I I always think like. I mean, to your point, like Christianity, there's a lot of sort of different flavors of it. You know, there's um, like Josh is a conservative Christian. I I tend to view myself as more progressive Christian. We we still believe and worship the same God, but you know, he just comes at it from a, a different way. I call it the wrong way, and I come at it from from a, a, another way. You know, and 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 like in 2016, he voted for Trump because like he. He had very strong feelings that are sort of, you know, very typical of Christian views. Um, but in 2020, he couldn't bring himself to support, you know, this King Cyrus, <laughs> you know, like, uh, so he voted third party or whatever like that, you know, and, and I just think like, there are probably a lot more Christians out there like that. Um, so, so where, where, you know, these politicians or these, um, you know, the Shang Fuchs of the world, like finding people to help support them. A lot of the way they do it, frankly, is through the so-called culture wars. It was, you know, it's abortion always, um, same sex marriage. It's the, you know, get, if the way it works is if you want, you know, if the movement leaders want healthcare hollowed out and they want to destroy public education, get everybody upset about so-called critical race theory in public schools, which is frankly not taught in public schools. It's um, a kind of race baiting. Um, if you want to uh, minimize uh, rights for the workforce, get everybody upset about abortion, you know, and, uh, and if you can get people to vote on a single issue, you can control their vote. They know that very well. I think a lot of the problem um, has to do with the fact that we have a kind of commentary class so this, that doesn't really recognize that this is not about those so-called culture war issues. This is not about, um, you know, transports. I get, I get email every single day from, you know, various movement organizations and it's like transports all the time because, you know, they do the, their market research, they figure out the wedge issues that are going to work for people, and then they try and get them upset about those issues. If you can get people upset about an identity issue like that, they won't pay attention to all this other stuff that they're doing. It's like, oh, look at this little shiny bobble over here <laughs> that, you know, I mean, whatever you think of that issue, the fact is, if you're allowing these small issues, which the movement leaders are actually cultivating and promoting, so like there's one state where there's like literally one trans athlete who wanted to join a school sports team, whatever. And then they're like politicizing off that every single day. Look, our country has some real problems. And on that issue in particular, the science is still coming in. These are sometimes issues that can be handled on a, an individual basis or whatever. But it, it, regardless of that, they're doing that so that we're not dealing with the issue of accessible health care rights for the workforce, some environmental issues or um, uh, some issues relating to, um, 
you know, the way the workforce is being treated, issues that bread and, the integrity of public education, these bread and butter um, issues that really matter in the lives of the overwhelming majority of Americans. So I think the problem is that there's some commentators who kind of watch a crime or corruption taking place and then tell you it's politics as usual. They'll tell you that, say, when they see this uh, capital assaulted or, or the calls for death of public officials, they'll say, well, that's okay. They're just exercising their First Amendment rights. Or when the FBI executes a search warrant as part of a criminal investigation to espionage, they'll frame it as part of a partisan conflict and say, oh, we need to get opinions from both sides. This is not normal. This is not a normal, we're not in a normal place in our politics. This is not um, kind of a partisan um, conflict as usual. We're dealing with licensing of corruption. Um, we're, we're dealing with a kind of willingness to tolerate not just calls for violence, but actual violence. Um, mm -hmm. I believe there are various organizations that from you know um, security organizations in the United States that were for many years focused on the threats of Islamic extremism and now they're actually admitting well the number one threat to our country is right-wing extremism kind of ethno nationalism uh, white nationalism these are the, the number one threats to to the security of our country and I, and I believe that they are <laughs> it's so it's so weird so like um so I'm a parent I've got two boys. Uh, my oldest is eight, my my youngest is six, and we just we just recently watched uh, Ninjago. So like we're 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 a big Lego family here. <laughs> like like uh, if if anybody's seen it, like you'll 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 know that they're in the movie. They um the the oh gosh the master master Wu I think it's the name of the master. Anyways, it's not important. But but he he has like uh, an ultimate ultimate weapon, and the ultimate ultimate weapon is basically just like a little red laser pointer that distracts the cat. <laughs> there you go. Well, <laughs> yeah, we, we were a big Lego family too when our son was little. Oh my gosh, it was all Legos all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, like, I know I was thinking about, you know, like when you say, you know, the certain groups like to sort of shine the little wavy thing to kind of, you know, get our attention on whatever, like that, that was, that was the image that came to mind was like, yeah, people are, are using the ultimate, ultimate weapon, you know, like, yeah. hey, look over there. That's exactly what they do. And, you know, so I've been to these pastor gatherings, like I've been to a Faith Winds gathering and Watchmen on the Wall gathering, Church United gatherings. They're these organizations that draw pastors into networks and um, they'll draw pastors of many different denominations and also non-denominational, of course, into these, like, I'll just give you an example. I went to the Faith Winds. Um, they, they've done hundreds of these events across the country. And so I was at this church in, uh, in, in Virginia and there were dozens of pastors area and it's sort of a, you know, swing district, uh, you know, so it's an advance of an election. They're trying to get everybody on board with politics. They know if you can get the pastors, you can get their congregation. So first they get up there, David Barton, you know who he is. He's the a sort of myth maker Christian of Christian nationalist history. He and his son are giving presentations. He couldn't speak that day because he had lost his voice, but his son was giving a presentation about how America's founded to be an ultra-conservative Christian nation. And, you know, our founders were all Bible thumpers, which is absolutely not true. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, some other guy gets up and says, the, the church is not a cruise ship. The church is a battleship. Said that. And he said, you need, pastors need to get involved. We're like, you know, we're the, on the front lines here and they give out voter guides that leave no question whatsoever on how to get their congregations to vote their so-called biblical values which inevitably boil down to abortion same-sex marriage um your man look you know my husband and i have been married over 20 years you know we we've had our share of you know challenges i can't blame a single one of them on our gay neighbors down the street i don't know i don't know what you guys are talking about i just can't um and then um and then they they brought in what they called an elections integrity specialist sorry about the, the aircraft um a fellow named Hogan gidley who used to be a member of the sorry can you hear me <laughs> yeah yeah i i, I, I can okay. i can hear you sorry about that this guy hogan gidley is former member of the trump administration was there as an elections integrity specialist 
and he was spreading lies about the election. He said, you guys saw what happened in Arizona. Well, the in Arizona, the, the Republican-led investigation had already taken place and Republicans found nothing. And yet here he is still spreading lies and al alleging that this is, um, that this is a, a problem. So I think, and, and then he said, you guys need to vote. He was spreading these lies about dead people voting and all and the like. And so he was there basically to spread misinformation to these pastors. And listen, most people, I don't know about you, but I'm like, I'm glued to the news. Most people aren't. Most people have you know other things to do with yeah. their lives and they're like getting this is where they're getting their political information. And um, and that's how that's how this um this whole you know what is starting to rain here. I, I am so terribly sorry. <laughs> it's, I do not want my computer to get rained on. It's it's it, it, it's it's okay. We 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 knew this would this would possibly happen. So so right. why don't um why don't we just take a pause? Maybe we can call this uh, part one, and then we will come back um, and uh, and try later. I can't wait. I really look forward to communicating with you again and to uh, connecting with uh, with with uh, with your co-host and um thank you so much for this terrific conversation yeah yeah thank you Catherine. and uh yeah uh, we will uh, talk soon all right looking forward <laughs> yeah we'll see you bye. bye yeah i think there's an there's a tendency for for americans to believe that 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 we can solve all problems uh and that that if we fail to solve a problem it's because of an ill intention on the part of somebody and i think that is that is absolutely you know what is it, the uh, uh, Occam's razor uh, idea that, you know, the, the most likely thing is the most sim simple? It's, it's usually because the, you know, the, often it's because the, the bureaucracy simply couldn't, uh, couldn't cope with it or some, so, you know, or it was just bad timing or something. Um, so despite the, the, the uh, uh, you know, it's very easy to see conspiracy theories everywhere, but often it's just simply an Im imperfection or a, uh, a lack of, um, uh, of, of communication. Um, and, but at the same time, it's a big, it, you know, in this case, it's in, in the case of Benghazi, these are big red flags. If we have so much miscommunication and, and the bureaucracies are not speaking, and the, and the intelligence and security agencies aren't speaking to one another, and the president is spending so much time basically uh, worry, trying to fight off anticipated attacks instead of uh, pouring resources into uh, restructuring and beefing up our capacities to detect them in the first place, um, that's a big problem. Um, and I think that the Benghazi attack and, and others before it were all – uh, kind of warnings that we, we really need to look at the uh, at, at, at the structure of, of government and how politics has uh, de has has eroded it. Um, so that's that's uh, that, that's one. Um, in terms of uh, I don't know. The other thing is that you know I, I I I honestly think after after speaking to so many people on the right and the left that you know most people are 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 basically want to do the right thing and are they're certainly conditioned by, by what the people around them, uh, say. Uh, and, um, you know, this, the, the, the way that American society is structured these days, there aren't that many often opportunities to, to, to hear or, or experience another perspective. And, uh, I mean, that's one thing that I actually mentioned in the book is, you know, I feel particularly uh, lucky in the sense that I grew up in a very sort of diverse, uh, environment in, in Berkeley, California, the, the capital of, of, of left-wing America. And, um, uh, you know, I was exposed to a lot from, from a really young age. And then I had the, uh, uh, the privilege to be, to, to, to travel and live in other countries like Yemen and, uh, you know, and, uh, and Jordan and Tunisia on U S government fellowships. Uh, I mean, I think the Fulbright program is an amazing, uh, uh, tool, which is always under, under, under funding, uh, attack, but, uh, you know, you take somebody and you send them to another country for a year and, and have them live with other, other people who have different perspectives and that can't help, can't, uh, help, but improve their tolerance and ability to, to see the bigger picture. And that's what we need these days is wow. much more. Yeah, it's so true. So, um, so kind of as we wrap up here, <clears throat> you know, if I am a reader coming into this book blind, you know, 
maybe not hearing this interview or having one view about, you know, Benghazi, you know, left or right. Um, what, what am I, the reader going to walk away, um, thinking about Benghazi? Well, hopefully, uh, my, 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 my hope is that the reader will come away, uh, from this believing that in fact, Benghazi was a significant historical event that, uh, it, it was, it, it emerged from, uh, a, a series of other, uh, decisions that were taken, uh, at various levels of the U S government and that it had very significant impacts on how we, uh, on, on both American, um, just the tenor of American political discourse these days, but also specific conflicts like what happened to Libya, what happened, you know, in, 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 in other areas in the, in the region. And, um, and hopefully, uh, you know, I, I've tried to be as balanced as I possibly can. I hopefully I've been able to sort of, um, debunk some of the, the grand conspiracy theories, but point to a plausible way that all of this unraveled that, you know, where there's a, you can sort of see where the, where the conspiracy things th came from, but there are other bigger lessons like let's fix this stuff so that this doesn't happen again. Yeah, that, that, that's so awesome. So, so this, this, uh, pod will be released, um, on Tuesday, September 6th, which, um, so we're recording this on September 5th, 5th. Um, so, um, where, where can people get it, get the book? Um, learn more about you, um, and, and anything else that, that you can, you can tell us, you know, where we can make sure that the word gets out about this book. Okay. Well, thank you. This is, this is the book. Um, <laughs> although I, I'm not sure it's, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of striking design. Um, uh, uh it's, it's on Amazon, um, and, uh, it's in, um, uh, bookstores near you. Um, it should be fairly easy to get, uh, hopefully. <laughs> Um, I'm curious, I don't know what the reaction is going to be. It's, uh, you know, again, it's one of this, it's, it's, it's perplexing. It's one of these issues that, you know, people, n you know, it, have most likely heard about, but at the same time have very complex, I think, fe feelings about, um, so we'll, we'll see, but yeah. hopefully it, it, it helps I, uh, in, in, in form people. I should also say that a lot of the, book, I, you know, a good part of the book is written in, in, in first person. So I talk about you know, what I was experiencing at different points during this whole, whole story. It's not just dry, uh, policy or hopefully it's not dry. Um, but it's, it really is, uh, <laughs> a lot of it is my own sort of testimony. The things that I w wasn't able to say when, when, uh, when I couldn't get a word in ed edgewise. Oh, that, well, uh, we really appreciate you one writing the book and then coming um, on our show to talk about it. Um, you know, Benghazi is for me anyways, has always been one of those hot button political issues that I don't know. I mean, that I don't have a strong opinion one way or another, with the exception of, you know, anytime we lose American lives overseas, it, it, it should make everybody pause to just think like, was our mission, our operation in that particular area necessary? Um, so sometimes the answer is yes. And sometimes the answer is no. Um, and, and I think Benghazi is one of those one of those situations where I just, I didn't know enough about what we were doing there to really have an opinion one way or another. So, um, so I, I appreciate you, uh, you, you know, kind of giving us your, your first yeah. account. Um, it's been really, really helpful and, uh, yeah. And I, I wish you good luck with, with the sales and, you know, looking towards that New York times bestseller list, right? Yes. <laughs> your dog agrees with me. Definitely agrees. <laughs> <laughs> all right well with that thank you very much we will see you all next week you thanks too. thank you bye. for having me on